Well, we include it uh, in pretty much all our courses now. Uh, we've created three open educational resource ebooks for our students, and we maintain them uh, regularly, uh, whether it's uh, updating edits or adding more review um, and creating those uh, open educational resources for our students in our programs. And that actually makes two of the programs that Suzanne and I teach in textbook free. So they, there's no textbooks. Well, I'm lucky because I get to work with a team who are dedicated to working on open things. So we have space to explore, to think about all the ways that open can make the world a better place, can make education better. Mm -hmm. So we do everything from building OERs to thinking about um, open pedagogies and how do you make that work in in a very traditional conservative university environment that doesn't move very quickly um, and, and what are the risks and benefits to, uh -huh. to using OERs all the time. Uh -huh. So that's, uh, that's what we do. So I uh, try and put uh, open education into everything I do. So uh, I'm involved in a lot of different projects. Uh, I've been involved in some instructional video projects and trying to make those openly licensed. Uh, I try and bring OER into the classroom. So I recently uh, and of course I taught this past fall, uh, out, the outcome was a textbook that the students co-wrote based on their work. Uh, and I also do a lot of advocacy work both uh, here in Alberta and at the national level trying to get uh, more government funding for open educational resources so that others have time, capacity and funds to create OER. So Rebus as a whole organization, we do a few different things. We offer different services and professional development programs for educators who want to learn more about creating or adapting open educational resources. Um, we also publish openly licensed guides. So we have one about making text, open textbooks with students. We have one about the open publishing um, process. We also just released two this year about OER efficacy as well as um, equity in OER creation. So definitely check them out if you're interested. They're online and freely available. <laughs> You can find us at rebus.community, and I'll just underscore that we are a charity, so our work is mission-driven, it's values-driven, and we are always open to opportunities that uh, make us pause and reflect. So if there are co-creation opportunities, if you want to bring us on as a consulting partner, as a thought partner to help you with the challenges that you are facing, mm -hmm. our doors are open to use that word. <laughs> That sounds very good. The word open, you know, <laughs> doors are open, education is open. Okay, so, yeah. wow, I do, I, I do a bit. Is it a big question for a short time? <laughs> okay, so um, I'm the project leader for the Open Ed Influences at Nelson Mandela University. I started the project, I've been running it, I found funding, and we've got quite a decent cohort of students who have now exited the project annually and are practitioners in open. Right? They've got skills developed um, and they go into their respective career fields mm -hmm. with open as part of their toolkit, which w is wonderful. Which career fields? So it's, it's diverse because open isn't about any one subject. It's not even about education. It's universal. So. Yeah, it's not even about higher education. Something we're not seeing enough of right now is open education in the commercial field. You know, and in industry, so we seem to have claimed open education. Like we, we, we keep pointing fingers at publishers and saying publishers, you know, that copyright thing. But we are almost copywriting open education for higher education. And I think that we should, we should branch out. Open education is about skills development and yeah. the engagement therein. Broader, broader understanding of education. And how do you use open for the greater good and not just in a education setting in your community for example so as an indigenous woman culture community sovereignty governance is really important to me uh, along with uh, ceremonial practices and revitalizing my language and understanding and then working on the coast working with uh, Coast Salish people to have a better understanding of what their community protocols are since I'm on their lands living there now so for me where I fit in especially within the 
open educational community is more of that critical challenge to it to kind of help people to understand how knowledge is not just a binary thing. Many people have different ways of knowing. And I work within an institution in a library where we steward a lot of knowledges that were taken from communities without consent and are just being widely shared to individuals. So working with you know researchers, students, community members, for community members to reclaim their knowledges, to repatriate it, to have a better understanding of how the community say those knowledges could be shared, but also having those conversations with researchers and students being like, you know, this knowledge was taken from communities without consent in the 1800s, and what does that mean for your research? How do you begin to identify those kind of issues within your research, but have really important conversations about it within the works that you're producing and acknowledge communities within the works that are coming out now. So you use your power as a library of, uh, for empowering yeah, exactly. the indigenous. Yeah, yeah, as a strong Métis woman, I guess. Just creating trouble wherever I go. <laughs> I must go back to the day I became a general secretary of a digital uh, university in France and I discovered that uh, Because we were funding uh, uh, many teaching contents, we had the right to say it should be accessible to anyone. And this is the reason why I am still motivated 14 years after I came to higher education and I, I became an advocate. Uh, I went to the French Ministry for Higher Education in 2015. I became a digital expert in Open Education Europe and International. This is how I met Open Education Global. Finally, I was elected thanks to the fact that we are in France sustainable members. And this is, I am only part of this movement. There are many teachers and many people who believe in this. So my action was to create, after I was elected and there was the lockdown, Open Education Global Francophone. It's, you call, you take your phone and you call all friends and colleagues who are convinced of open education and they call, call their own friends and you hire uh, someone who is specialized in web marketing to find unknown people also, not uh, the already convinced one. And then uh, we created a two days uh, uh, webinar with 21 webinars in total in November 2020 and since then we have a monthly webinar Uh, francophone for francophone people and they come from uh, really all around the world and I had a call to benevolent and I work with a Canadian, a Cameroon um, um, a mathematic teacher, a Tunisian a professor in, uh, in, uh, also in mathematics <laughs> and, uh, and the French, uh, the French team from University of Nantes, I am myself from the University of Lille And all together, we have already made it better and better, those webinars, and we, we found our public. So uh, there's two answers. The first one is locally. So locally, we've got a lot of work to do to convince people around us in France, but also in the Université de Nantes, to try to move towards that. So it's every day trying to convince one person at a time. And then, of course, there's the global agenda, where UNESCO plays a major role, and we work with UNESCO and with other organizations to try and, again, build the global agenda, think about what are the research issues here, and try to also find some money to do these things. Yeah. 